Thank you for joining me for Lesson 6 of the Absolutely Trinity series. I want to start out by saying thank you to all of those that have written and encouraged me to continue putting these videos out. They've been a great encouragement. I also want to say God bless every one of you that have come out of the Oneness Doctrine, and I'm finding out that there's been many. And I want to say God bless you for serving the true God of Heaven. I also want to say thank you to all the Apostolics and UPC people that have written me and and uh, said some of the things, some of the mean things you've said, and try to refute me. And some have not been mean; some have been nice. But I also want to say thank you for encouraging me to uh, forge on with these videos. Uh, you have really put fire in me to continue this out. And so I want to say thank you to all of those apostolic and UPC pastors and preachers and teachers that have written me and and uh, said uh, the many mean and unkind things that you've said. I'm not a bit angry at you. I thank God that I have people like you to encourage me and put zeal and fire into my heart and spirit to do these things. And I'm glad that the videos have helped so many of you out there. You've wrote and told me that they've been a blessing to you, and I'm glad. In return, I'd like to ask that you pray for me. Pray for my family, the church of pastor here. We sincerely want to shine a light in this dark world. And I also want to remind you that for the most part, the videos that you're watching are more or less condensed versions of a teaching series that I did here at the church. And so if you're interested, you can go to our website and you can download the entire series for free. Not only that series, but several others, and you'll find them there and a lot of sermons that I've preached. Just go to GodsMiracleMission.com, hit the Media tab, the Audio tab, Teaching tab, and then the Trinity tab. And I believe that they'll be a blessing to you. Now, by way of introduction, I want to point out that there are four areas of doctrine that one as Pentecostals are especially weak and open to effective refutation. Number one, their denial of the pre-existence of Christ. Number two, their belief that Jesus was himself the Father. And number three, their belief that baptism in Jesus' name is necessary for salvation. And number four, their belief that tongues is a necessary sign of salvation. In Lessons 6-8, through eight, I want to deal with the oneness adherence false teaching on water baptism. I want to expose the errors of baptismal regeneration and the idea that water baptism must be done in Jesus' name only. The Jesus only people hate to be called a cult, but when you look at their doctrines and see how far removed they are from traditional Christianity, we have no other choice but to label them for what they are. They're a cult. Did you know that the Oneness Pentecostal movement is nothing more than a split off of the Assemblies of God? Early 1900s, that's right. They, they came out of a traditional Trinitarian organization and created their own organization. Their belief in baptismal regeneration is not exclusively on their own either. This doctrine, this, this belief in baptismal regeneration, puts them in a clique with several others. So if... You would like for me to, I will mention a few of these heretical groups that the UPC Apostolics are right in the midst of. Have you ever heard of uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? Well, we call them the Mormons. Or how about the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Church of Christ? What about the Seventh-day Adventists or Christian Science? You, you've heard of the names of these cults. These are the believers that teach and preach that you have to be baptized in water to go to heaven. Alexander Campbell is the father of this heresy. The apostolic and UPC adherents are smack dab in the middle of all of these well-known cults. They're nothing more than Campbellites. Anyone who teaches anything other than salvation by faith alone, they are a true blue, uh, bona fide, grade A, first class cult. And you need to know that because it's just an absolute fact. The Oneness people have basically took one verse of Scripture and created an entire doctrine out of it. That verse is Acts 2.38. Let's read it, and then we'll read its accompanying verses, and then we'll talk about it a little while. Let's look at Acts 2.37, uh, down through 2.39. The Bible said, And now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts, and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Because of their faulty interpretation of this passage of Scripture, they teach four false doctrines. 
I know it's hard to believe that that many false doctrines can be taught out of one verse, but boy, they can do it. First, they teach that water baptism is necessary to receive salvation. Secondly, they teach that the baptismal formula has to be in Jesus' name. Thirdly, they teach that you have to be baptized in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in unknown tongues in order to be saved. And finally, they teach that these steps have to be in this exact order. All four of these beliefs are erroneous. But what do you expect from preachers and teachers that believe that Jesus is his own dad? It's hard to believe that anyone could teach that a person is still a sinner even after they've repented and believed the gospel. But according to Jesus' only teaching, your sins are not washed away into the moment of water baptism. Obviously, if your sins have not been washed away, you're still a sinner. Therefore, according to them, if you die without being water baptized, you go straight to hell. This is called the doctrine of baptismal regeneration, and it is a wicked doctrine. In this lesson, I want to expose it as the heresy that it is. When reading the Bible, it's very important that you interpret each verse in the context of the chapter that it's located. Now, uh, on top of that, you've got to interpret each chapter in the context of the book, and each book in the context of the entire Bible. When you come across a passage of Scripture that seemingly contradicts the spirit and nature of the rest of the Bible, you've got to remember that the Bible never contradicts itself. There are verses in God's Word that, if taken out of context, can be terribly misunderstood. When you come across a, a difficult passage, instead of changing your entire system of theology to line up to those two or three verses, you need to go to God in prayer, all the while engaging in diligent study to understand how those verses flow with the rest of the Word of God. The assuring thing is, God has not given us just two or three verses. We've got over 30,000 within 66 books. We can pretty much know the mind of the Lord on any given subject. When we look at the spirit of the New Testament, we see that salvation is received through repentance, through faith in Jesus Christ, not through water baptism and speaking in tongues. At least 60 times in the New Testament, it speaks to us of having uh, obtained salvation by faith alone and never mentioning baptism in those verses. If baptism is in fact necessary for salvation, why is there this emphasis on faith uh, and believing for salvation, but not on water baptism? Now, well, here's an example of what I'm talking about. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Very familiar passage of Scripture. The Bible said, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. When somebody tells you that you've got to be baptized in order to receive salvation, what they've done is twisted the entire Bible to fit a handful of verses. The really sad thing is this resting of Scripture is not necessary. These verses are really not that hard to understand. To hear a baptismal regeneration is taught, you'd think that every mention of baptism in the Bible is a reference to water baptism. But this is simply not true. According to Hebrews 6 and 2, there's more than one type of baptism. And I'll give you an example. In Luke 3.16, the Bible speaks of the baptism in the Holy Ghost and fire. You go to Mark chapter 10, verses 38-39, as well as Luke 12.50, and you find the Word of God speaks of a baptism of suffering. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 2, we see a baptism into Moses spoken of. Baptism is simply a submersion or an immersion, being submerged into something. Jesus will submerge us, immerse us into the Holy Ghost. He said that we can be submerged into His suffering, into His death. Baptism is a word often used to indicate you are a follower or a disciple of a, pro of a prophet. In 1 Corinthians 10 and 2, were they literally baptized into the body of Moses? Well, of course not. The Israelites were submerged into Moses and his leadership, not into the body of Moses, that would be ludicrous. But nevertheless, you'll find in 1 Corinthians 2, uh, 10 and 2, reference of being baptized into Moses.